Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, this is Ruba. I'm Igor. Hi, guys. Um, and we'll talk about design and implementation of a Rockset, a data system we built for low latency queries uh, for search and analytics. Uh, let us first quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, Druba is a CTO and co-founder at Rockset. Uh, prior to Rockset, he founded the RocksDB project at Facebook. And before that, he built Hadoop file system uh, HDFS and was also a contributor to HBase. Uh, I'm Igor, I was a software engineer at, I'm software engineer at Rockset. Um, I worked with Druba on RocksDB project at Facebook, and I also contributed to some GraphQL initiatives also at Facebook. So today we'll talk about the idea of converged indexing. Uh, we'll also discuss how we execute query, uh, query execution over distributed index um, for search analytics. And then we'll also discuss how we execute um, index updates and how we scale Rockset in the cloud and how cloud changes the game when it comes to designing data systems. So the motivation for building Rockset was twofold. We wanted to build a system that's both easy to use and is also high performance. And if you think about all the data systems out there, this is usually a co contrary goal, right? Like let's say you want a database to, make, uh, to be high performance, what you have to do is you have to configure indexing, you have to configure partitioning, you have to configure sort key. There's so many things to configure and usually the, the difference in uh, speeds can be 10x. Um, we want to build a system that both minimizes configuration, but also allows you to um, perform extremely low latency queries. Um, we also want to build a system that can connect to any data source, and some data sources have high velocity, so we need to implement a system that supports high throughput writes. And finally, um, we want to support a system that can do real-time writes, because without real-time writes, um, your system is not easy to use. So let's talk about the idea of converged indexing. How many of you are familiar with columnar storage and the idea of columnar storage? Okay, most of you. Um, so columnar storage, so I'll just go over this couple of next slides quickly. Then, um, so the columnar storage as opposed to row-based storage where you store each row separately on, uh, on storage medium. Uh, in columnar storage, you store each column separately and you store columnar values uh, close together. What this allows you to do is allows you great compression uh, ratios because columnar values are usually similar to each other and you can do some advanced features like uh, role, run length encoding and things like that to make it very small in size. And then when you have query, uh, you can only fetch uh, columns that the query needs even though the table might have many other columns because you store each column separately. And uh, here I have an example of Vertica which uh, popularized this technology and Redshift and BigQuery which are also uh, big users of columnar storage. Uh, let's go over one example where we have two documents on the left side. We have document number zero and document number one with three uh, columns, name, interests, and last active. And on the right-hand side, you see the example of the columnar encoding. So you see the column name. Uh, we store first document ID, then the document uh, column value. Um, and then for interests, we, we do the same thing. We're now in document ID. We also include the index where this, um, where this value appeared because interests um, is an array. Uh, the big advantage of columnar storage it is very cost effective because of uh, good compression ratios. It also executes queries that are narrow uh, over white tables very well uh, because you can avoid a lot of I.O. by not touching the columns you do not need. Um, it's also good for scan queries because most of the time uh, in columnar storage uh, your queries need to scan a lot of data set. You, you cannot use an index to, to filter the data out. And as such, um, analytical queries are a good use case for columnar storage. Uh, however, on the disadvantages side, usually most columnar storage systems have high write latency. What that means is when you write a um, new document to your storage, it takes a while, a couple seconds, maybe even a couple minutes, to reflect this write in your queries. Um, also, because you have to scan the entire data set with columnar storage, your read latency is always at least two second, uh, a couple seconds or higher. Um, and as such, usually it's not suitable for online applications. You can rarely use columnar storage uh, to front your uh, web app or, or something that is customer facing. Uh, on the other side, we have search indexing, where uh, technology used by Elasticsearch, Solar, which are both backed by Lucene, where for each value, we store a list of documents that contain that value. Uh, we call this a posting list. And the operation that search indexing allows is it allows us to quickly retrieve a list of document IDs that match a certain predicate. For example, let's uh, go back to our uh, two documents from before. 
And on the right-hand side, you see how would the storage look like uh, on a search index. So you, you will see that we just basically flipped the ordering of two, um, of two components. So now instead of mapping from document ID to the column value, we map the column value to document ID in which those, that column value appears. So if you look at interests, we have a column value databases and we say uh, the search index stores a list of um, documents in which databases appear, which is 0.0, uh, zero, dot zero uh, document 0, index 0, and document 1, index 1. And that is called uh, posting lists. Uh, search indexing works perfectly well for high selectivity queries. When you have a query where only few documents remain after a filter, you can use an index and execute it in very, very low latency. Um, and because it su supports low latency, it's suitable for online applications. As you can imagine, all the search applications are online applications where you have a customer waiting for your results, Google search or any other search you have. On the disadvantages side, if you want to execute analytical queries over the search system, those are usually slower than they would be in the native uh, columnar store uh, system. So the idea that we uh, built Roxeton and the idea we're introducing here today is the idea of converged indexing, which is why wouldn't you put both columnar store and search index in the same system? Um, we built converged indexing idea on top of key value store abstraction. Um, and key value store abstraction, you can think of it as abstraction that supports three operations, uh, put key value pair into key value store, uh, retrieve a key and its value, and it also provides us um, a way to iterate over the sorted data set. So it provides a sorted view of the data. And each document that we insert into converge indexing maps to many, more than one key value pairs uh, in our key value store. And as an example, we have uh, docs, document number zero, document number one, they're a little bit more simple, simpler this time. And on the right hand side, you see how we would store uh, those two documents uh, in the converged indexing key value store. Uh, so we have a row store where the first component of the key uh, is the document ID and the second component of the key is a column name. Um, as such, you can see that all the values for a particular document are stored closer together because our document ID is the first component of the key. Uh, we also insert the document into column store where we, um, the first component of the key in the column store is the column name, and the second component of the key is document ID. As such, you can see that we store, what we store close together is all values for a particular column. So if you want to scan um, our data set for all values for column name, we can quickly do that because they're all stored uh, close together. Uh, it also works well for caching. And then finally, we also insert our two documents into a search index, where the first component of the key is column name, the second column, uh, component of the key is column value, and then final component of the key is document ID. So for example, if, if I were to search for all documents where name is equal to Druba, I would know exactly where to look at and retrieve a list of documents that match uh, name equal to Druba, in this case, document number one. Um, so what conver converged indexing allows us to do is it allows us to execute both fast analytical queries and fast search queries. And then we build a smart optimizer that based on a query decides whether to use a column store or to use a search index. So for example, if we have two SQL queries over here. On the left hand side, we select star from search logs where keyword equals strata and locale equals English. And this is usually, a, you know, you can imagine this a query where it's highly selective, only a few documents match, and as such, our optimizer would send it to the search index. On the right hand side, we have a huge aggregation where for each keyword, we want to know number of occurrences of that keyword and uh, we would send it to the columnar store because there's basically no filter. We need to scan the entire data set. And the cool part is because we, here we only use keyword column, uh, we would only touch uh, data for key keyword column through the columnar store. We don't have to load the entire data set into memory. Roxas is a data system built on the idea of converged indexing. Um, we provide a way to index all the fields. We want to make it easy to use, so we index all the fields. We also make it easy to use, so it provides a natural SQL interface with full feature joins, aggregations, and all things you would expect from a SQL implementation. Uh, we provide document model, uh, so this is JSON or anything that, we, that can be converted into JSON, and we are fully schemaless. There's no schema to configure. Um, you just insert documents and we figure it out on the fly. Uh, we also support real-time writes, updates, and deletes, and we export a Roxit service as a cloud service uh, through a REST API. So now that we covered that, uh, let me talk a little bit about how query execution works and how we actually implemented um, Roxit. 
So there's three layers of the Rockset architecture. Uh, from the top down, we first have a Rockset SQL API, which is an API that deals with authentic uh, authentication, authorization, uh, metadata management, all, all the cool stuff. Then we have a second layer, which is aggregators. Uh, those are fully stateless uh, compute nodes. And on the bottom part, we have leaves, uh, which are nodes that actually hold storage and hold our, our data. Um, leaves hold converged index in a key value store. For our implementation, we chose RocksDB because we are most familiar with that, but you can choose any other um, key value store as well. And then we shard the converged index across RocksDB instances in the leaves. Uh, we use document-based sharding, and what that means is for one document, and all of its indexes lives on exactly one shard, um, on one leaf node. And as such, whenever you have a query, we have to hit all shards to see whether uh, any data from any shard actually matches our query. Um, so let's a little bit, talk a little bit about how actual query execution works. So we have, a, as I said, we have a SQL-based interface. So aggregator would receive the SQL query, and it would do all the traditional uh, SQL query parsing, compilation, optimization. And as an output of that process, it would print out operator DAG. Uh, what operations do we have to execute and also in which uh, sequences? Once we have operator DAG, we would split it into set of instructions for each nodes. Um, so each node would get three components. One thing is predecessors, who is sending you data. Another thing is operators, or what, uh, what execution, uh, what operations do you have to do on those tuples you receive from your predecessors. And the third component is successors. Uh, who do you send data to once you're done computing? Obviously, not everybody has predecessors. Uh, Leafs would usually receive only operators and successors because they produce tuples from uh, storage. And then on each node, as soon as they get instructions, node would open ports, wait for predecessors to join and to say, hey, I'm ready to send you data. Uh, it would connect to its successor saying, hey, I might have data that I have to send you. And then as soon as that happens, as soon as all the con uh, connections are, are uh, set up, the data starts flowing bottom up. So leaves start producing the data, uh, sending aggregators, and aggregators start doing whatever they have to do, aggregation, joins, and uh, all the cool stuff. Uh, aggregators send the results to the um, uh, Rocks at SQL API, which sends the results back to, see, uh, to the client in the streaming fashion. So as soon as one tuple is available on the API server, we push it out to the client, even though the execution might still be going on, and this is how we actually also achieve our low latency uh, execution path. And with that, I want to give it to uh, Druba now to actually explain um, how, we, uh, how are we able to actually build those high throughput index updates. Okay, thank you, Igor. Uh, any questions so far based on the talk that the portion that Igor uh, covered, which is very much about what is converged indexing and how we leverage it to give you low latency queries on large data sets. Uh, the, that part, the, the remainder part of the talk is mostly about uh, what are the challenges when we build this system? What are the technical challenges that we encountered when we build this system? And why is it different from other systems that are out there? And what is it that motivated us to build this system now versus 10 years back or 15 years? What a change in the recent past that a low latency query on large data sets is now possible? Uh, and also, uh, I have a set of slides, but I would like you to ask me questions so I can, in, I can pause my talk and answer questions uh, live instead of w waiting till the end of the talk. Sounds good? Um, <clears throat> so traditional um, indexing uh, challenges that people have faced is that keeping an index system is very costly and it needs a lot of resources as far as hardware resources are concerned, right? Uh, because for every update, you might need to update a lot of indices. That, for every record, you might have to update a lot of indices. Uh, so there is a write-heavy system, possibly. Uh, one record, so let's say you have a bigger object that's coming into your system. Let's say records with 500 columns. And you want to index all the 500 columns. You might, some of the indexes might be on one machine. Some of the indexes might be on another machine. So that's a distributed systems problem. Also, if you have 500 columns in a field, uh, you might have to do 500 different writes or a large number of writes to update all these indices. So those are the traditional challenges of um, indexing in general. Let's talk about the first challenge in a little bit more depth, right? So let's say uh, there is a record which is, which is 500 columns or N columns that's coming into your system, and you want to update the 
primary index and the 499 secondary indices of your record, right? So now, how would you do this? Um, typically, how you do this is that you shard your document in a key value store or some other kind of storage system where some of the indices live on one machine, some of the other indices live on another machine. Uh, here, the picture is a document that's coming in with uh, three fields. And let's say the primary index is name, so that goes to one server where it's a key value store that indexes based on name. But then let's say the second field is interests, and that goes to another set of servers where you possibly index by key, by interest. And then the third one is the third field that you get indexed. So you would have to build some kind of um, a distributed mechanism to be able to update all these three things when a new document comes in. So you'd probably have to build Paxos or some kind of a distributed logging mechanism so that you don't update one server and forget to update the other servers. Also, you have to make sure that queries, uh, when the query, they actually see all these three fields from three different servers at the same time through some atomic visibility or uh, some kind of acid semantics. Yeah, make sense? So that's one of the traditional challenges of uh, indexing on a term sharded um, storage system. Do, do people understand the term sharding kind of an approach, which is more like HBase or Cassandra? Um, so yeah, so th that's the problem with indexing in general, right? So how does Rockset solve this problem? So what Rockset solves this problem is, um, what we do is that all new writes that come into our system, we write it to a distributed log. So the distributed log is much easier to scale compared to a Paxos or a Raft-based system because it just needs to deposit this data in some place. It's not queryable yet, but you can, basically you need a log for durability. So the moment data comes into your system, you log it into a distributed log. And the data now is in the log, but you can't really query this log because logs are typically like read at the bottom of the log or read from the tail of the log. So the value is actually in the index that we build from this log. And that is what Rockset is. So we tail this data from log and then that record that has been written to the distributed log, that actually goes to one server instead of all the servers sharded by some key. So the entire document goes to one designated or one server that you pick using either a hash mechanism or some other uh, routing mechanism. And the, fa the, 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 this design is called a document sharded system, which means that every document, they can go randomly to some server which gets stored. Yeah, that makes sense? So unlike, if you had used HBase or Cassandra to do this, that record might have gone to five different servers because the Cassandra and HBase are row partitioned. Uh, so depending on the value of the key, it would have gone to many different nodes because there are 500 records, 500 columns in this, fee, in this record. But for us, we go to one machine and we store the entire document on one machine. So we use doc sharding to solve the typical indexing problem on other key value stores like HBase and Cassandra, for example. The second problem that I wanted to mention about indexing in general is that, again, now let's say that your record has come to one machine you need to store it on this machine, on the storage system of this machine. But again, this record has 500 fields, so we don't want to update 500 different tables in your database system. Uh, in this example, I took the example of MySQL, for example. Suppose that single machine that you are using is a MySQL system. Um, let's say this record that is coming in, there are like six or three different fields that we need to update. Some of the fields started R, some of the fields started C, some of the fields started S. So typically what will happen is that we'll have a primary index and say a, sec a primary index table and a secondary index table on MySQL. When you say create index on a column, MySQL will create a table for that index, for storing that index. So now when, a, when this record comes in, which is 500 fields, you might need to update 500 different tables uh, as on that machine so that all your indexes are persisted and queryable. Yeah, make sense? So this is, there is a fan out on write on a single server if you use typical B3 based storage system. So how does Rockset solve this problem? So Rockset solves this problem by using the log structured merge technology that RocksDB has. So RocksDB is an open source piece of technology. It's a storage engine, high performance storage engine for flash and in-memory systems. And what it does is when a new document comes in, let's say again a document with 500 fields in them, it doesn't have, it puts this document in a memory buffer called the mem table. And then 
when enough things have accumulated in the mem table, it deposits it into one SSD file, one storage file on disk. So it doesn't try to write to all the 500, there are no 500 separate index tables, unlike say a B tree based system. It writes the whole new data that has come in into a new place in storage and it creates a new SSD file. So writes are cheap because it has amortized lots of document updates into one sequential big write into a storage file on the system. And the challenge though is that, um, so we have made the writes cheap, but can you guess uh, what the challenge would be when you're reading from the LSM engine. So one problem while reading from the LSM engine, now you need to look at all the SSD files to find out where your data is, right? Because new SSD files get keep, keep getting generated when new data comes in. So to avoid that problem, LSM engines like RocksDB, what they do is they compact all these SSD files in the background and try to create bigger size or uh, more compacted versions of SSD files so that you can actually go find the keys you're looking for using very few number of IOs instead of looking at every file in your storage system. And there are interesting things like Bloom filters and stuff like that that we use to reduce the number of random IOs when reads happen for, for our system. So again, uh, we address, the, the, just to summarize this challenge, that instead of a B-tree based system where uh, an index update fans out to multiple writes on storage, we use RocksDB's LSM to reduce the number of writes for updating indices. So these are two kind of interesting things that, have, uh, that we have leveraged and built um, to make indexing, the cost of indexing much cheaper compared to previous technologies out there. Uh, so what Rockset does is that if you deposit a data, a document in Rockset, we index everything in the document. So essentially if you're a database administrator or if you're a storage administrator, with previous technologies, you might have to do something like create an index on this column because you know that's the index you are querying. In Rockset, there's no such thing because by default, we index everything. So that means all queries are fast. We have reduced the cost of indexing so much that we can afford to index all your data and make all your queries fast. So as far as, um, that's, that's kind of the background of why indexing is possible and what you have done to make indexing feasible, economically feasible for a user now. The next part of the talk is more about uh, what are the challenges that you have done that you have faced to deploy this converged indexing solution to be usable by a user? How can a user actually use it? What are the challenges we have fixed in this to make it usable, instantly usable by a user? So we Rockset is a service that runs on the cloud. You can download this code into your own favorite desktop or your machine and run it. You can use the service um, and the reason Rockset is cost efficient compared to other systems, again, is because we realize that in the cloud, we don't buy machines, we rent machines, right? So, and the renting machines is a very different kind of uh, cloud economics compared to machines that we are used to buying earlier and putting it in my own data center. So here, the cost of renting one CPU for 100 minutes is the same price. The cloud vendors charge you the same price if you rent 100 CPUs for one minute. So this, is, this was quite revolutionary in my mind. This means that there's a hardware change which software can leverage. And what I feel is that for this uh, workload, what we have done is that we have looked at traditional uh, data processing software. Those are all built to say that how can I use 50 machines as efficiently as possible? How can I use 100 machines as efficiently as possible? Whereas for Rockset, that's not the goal. The Rockset is, if your query is there, we want to make it as fast as possible because the cloud economics says that if you use more resources, you'd be able to finish the job much faster at the same price. Make sense? So this is the reason why uh, indexing on the cloud has become economically feasible for our users and our architecture leverages this a lot. <clears throat> so, so that's the first part. And the second part is that what about storage? How can we scale storage? Uh, efficiently so that if somebody, people have large data sets that, we, that they want to index, how can we make it economically feasible to an architecture that can grow up and down? So I'm going to describe both of these to uh, a little bit more detail. The first one is more about CPU and the second one is more about storage. Yeah, is it making sense, these two challenges that I'm mentioning? Cool, okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, the compute uh, part of, compute side of things. So uh, Rockset uses uh, Kubernetes again. It's a, it's a containerized uh, 
software that we have that we use to deploy into the Rockset service. There are different microservices inside our Rockset service. We, we, have, we don't have the detailed design here, but you can look it up in our, in our, in our website. Um, the interesting thing is that um, people say that, hey, yeah, we use Kubernetes that solves lots of our problems. That's partially true, uh, but we had to build a different kind of scheduler to manage our storage systems on Kubernetes. So how many of you use Kubernetes for like deploying your solutions? Anybody here? Yeah, okay. So it's likely that a lot of you might have been using Kubernetes to deploy compute uh, kind of resources where you might need to do lambdas or you might need to execute some code um, on the fly and scale up and down using Kubernetes. But for us, we needed to use it for managing two things. One is um, we have a scheduler that we have built on top of Kubernetes that can manage both supply and demand. So if you look at traditional schedulers, like let's say you look at the high scheduler, like or you look at um, the Spark scheduler, for example, or any other job management schedulers. There, the whole goal of the scheduler is essentially uh, workload is coming in, and how can I deploy this workload into the machines that I have and make sure that everybody gets a fair sh fair share or deadline-based scheduling or whatever else is out there, right? So most of the schedulers, prior generation schedulers, were managing mostly uh, the demand that comes into your system. Whereas in Rockset, uh, we wanted to make this thing economically feasible for our users, so we, ha we had to design a scheduler which lets you manage both supply and demand, and not just the uh, demand of your, of your workload. So when more demand increases, we actually go look at Kubernetes. We have added additional uh, software on top of Kubernetes to be able to figure out how, many, how to add nodes to, the, to our Kubernetes cluster when there's more load on the system. This Kubernetes doesn't do by itself. Uh, you can grow pods, but you can't really grow nodes. There are new features coming into Kubernetes in the future. Um, similarly, for example, um, the cost effectiveness of our architecture comes by because we also shed hardware when there's not much use. So take, for example, when there's a lot of work, we try to get as many nodes as possible, execute queries in parallel, and finish it quickly. But then when there's not much work left to be done, we try to shed hardware. So if you compare it with, say, MongoDB, or you compare it with um, uh, Hive, for example, or HBase, there's the concept of shedding hardware doesn't exist which is why these systems are costlier in, in general because you have to buy 50 machines and you have to live with those 50 machines. Whereas in Rockset, the cost effectiveness of the solution comes because we can get rid of all the machines that we don't need the moment your sh software shrinks. So hardware elasticity is a primary citizen of our design in the Rockset architecture. Does it make sense? This is as far as question. Oh, great question, yeah. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So CPU demand comes from two different angles. One is when, you are, when new data is coming in, you have to index this data. So indexing data is a costly affair, right? I mean, if you have read all, uh, you must have seen the cost of indexing from all the Google and the Yahoo papers. And so cost of indexing is high CPU intensive. Similarly, the cost of queries. So we have a general purpose SQL query engine, which can do both columnar and indexed transparently, which means that our query engine can be as good or better than some of the warehouses that you might be using. Also, it's uh, better or same as some of the indexing systems like Solar or Elastic you might be using. Uh, and also, it is more cost efficient because, like I said, we don't have to provision for peak capacity. It's a very scalable hardware architecture in the background, which gives us the cost effectiveness of this solution. Does it, oh, the other question is about SQL queries. So if you have to do a lot of aggregations, if you have to do a lot of compute, if you have to do some kind of, um, some aggregations that has to go through large sections of your data sets, that will need a lot of CPU. Oh, great question. So um, there are two different workloads that I think I see. Uh, there's one workload where a user might have a lot of data and their queries are coming for a small section of their data set. So there you might be uh, storage bound because you need to be able to store all this data and you have enough CPU left to be able to process them. But then there are certain other data sets which are very small 
And so the, but the queries dominate them rather than the size of the data. Uh, again, um, very different workloads. What's that? Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> cool, yeah. So, so that's part, as far as the CPU scaling is concerned. I also have um, a, uh, a, another challenge that we had to fix was about scheduling storage. Now, have you heard about scheduling storage? I don't think we use this word at all. We mostly use words like configure storage or provision storage. But here I'm talking about scheduling storage because we are trying to make storage serverless or ways where you can grow and shrink it on demand. It's not like you have to provision something upfront before you actually start using it. So the way we do it is uh, new data gets stored, uh, new data gets into this, rocks, into this distributed log that you see on the far right of your, of your screen. And then um, we use, we have extended RocksDB using a, using a piece of open source software again that we have designed called RocksDB Cloud. So the RocksDB Cloud is the part that gives us the serverless storage concept in our architecture. So RocksDB Cloud, what it does is it, it indexes the data that is coming in from the distributed, uh, from, from, the, from, from the data that you are depositing into Rockset. It indexes them and then it creates these SST files that get deposited into cloud storage. So cloud storage could be Amazon S3 or it could be um, Azure storage or it could be Google Cloud, whatever cloud, or it could be your, some other backend cloud object store that you have, maybe Minio or something else. Uh, so essentially the whole point is that these three vertical things that you see, which are our three servers in this picture, they store data locally, but they also keep all the data on the cloud which means that if the server dies, we don't lose the data, which is what I mean by serverless storage in the sense the storage is, the data is actually stored in these objects or in cloud, cloud object store. So uh, RocksDB Cloud is an open source piece of software. Some people have used it. It's a, it's a C++ library. People have been using it for some other purposes other than Rockset, but it's a critical component of the Rockset backend architecture. It's an open source piece, so please feel free to like look at it and look at our contribute or, or, or co collaborate there on that project with us. Um, <clears throat> so now, how does it become uh, serverless or what is the benefit of putting all these SST files in the cloud transparently? So the benefit is that uh, RocksDB Cloud gives us this feature called zero copy clones or zero copy read replicas. What does it mean? So in the previous picture, you saw that if I go back, you see that there are three servers that are running here. Right? They are tailing, they're they are, they are indexing their data. And suddenly, let's say that more demand is coming of more documents are being put, so you need more compute to create those indices. So then we can very easily make a replica of one of these servers on demand. And that replica, what it does, it, it actually copies the SST files that were in cloud storage into its local store and starts from there. So this is what I meant by a zero copy clone is that we don't make replicas for durability. The durability is actually given by cloud storage. We make replicas for performance. When there's more work to be done, when you need more CPUs either for indexing or querying, we create replicas and those get created instantly because they can uh, clone data from existing cloud storage and start off from a checkpoint that has been created by other servers uh, in the recent past. <clears throat> mm. So, so yeah, so that is, that, is the, that, is the, that is one critical thing that we leverage from RocksDB Cloud to be able to give uh, the ability to scale up and down very quickly. Again, if one of the replicas are not using much CPU, we can shut it down very quickly uh, without losing any data because there is no cost of uh, copying data at the time of shutting it down. So uh, to, to, to sum it up, I kind of touched on two, three or four different things in general, mostly the challenges of indexing on a cloud system. Uh, but the, the big picture is that the Rockset architecture uses an architecture called aggregator leaf tailor architecture. It's very different from a Lambda architecture or any other architectures you might have seen for big data systems. Um, the aggregator leaf tailor architecture essentially focuses on the query side of things and not on the streaming side of things. So our, uh, the, the, our use cases are, um, take for example, uh, you, you, you somebody is producing a lot of data and you want to query them as soon as they're produced. You know, somebody is producing events and you want to query them without waiting for some big pipeline of things to happen. 
So the power of the engine is more on the query side, uh, which is why we build an index on all this data that is coming in. And we have a two level aggregators, which lets you parallelize queries uh, at a very high fashion and also able to um, spread out the workload and scale it out based on when the query comes in. There's a lot of description about the aggregator leaf tailor architecture in our post there. I, we don't have much time to go through all the details of this uh, architecture, but after this talk, please feel free to ask me questions about it. Uh, and just to sum it up, um, so Rockset, the whole technology that we have talked about today is essentially used by people to do event analytics. And uh, this is analytics unlike um, uh, putting analytics into Redshift or Snowflake because this is the question that I traditional that most people have asked me earlier. So ours is a mutable database, unlike warehouse where you can upload data every 10 minutes or every a new partition every five minutes. Ours is a mutable database, and you can query data as soon as it is being produced. And our it's an SQL engine. The only similarity with a warehouse is that Rockset is an SQL engine. Uh, but our focus is always on low latency queries. So the interesting, so the verticals that we typically see are things like people who can get the maximum value by querying its most recent data sets. Take for example security, fraud detection, take for example uh, reacting to sensor events or, uh, or other things that you're collecting or maybe reacting to for an e-commerce site, um, making changes to a catalog and reflecting it in your application very quickly. So it's very application focused. If you're writing a live application, you won't be using it to query Redshift because, or BigQuery because those are uh, real-time systems. Ours is a live system, and it's very much a live database that you can query on large data sets. Any questions? Uh, we have our email address also in case you want to ask us questions later or send email. Yeah, there's one question. Yes, absolutely. So we are a full featured SQL engine. You want to explore? Yeah, sure. This? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we support joins, we support aggregations. I think we support uh, almost all SQL features except windowing at this point, but we are also working on windowing. Yes, so um, the challenging part in building our SQL engines, so our SQL engine is built from scratch. Um, we only use the parser antler. Um, the challenging part, why we decided to build our own, is we wanted to provide a good SQL engine that works on uh, JSON uh, nested documents. And so if you have an array within an object, within an array within an object, it's extremely nested, and all the traditional SQL engines uh, added JSON support as a, you know, hey, later, let's, let's add some functions to deal with JSON, whereas we built it from scratch to actually um, work with JSON uh, as a first order uh, principle. And so we also support nested, uh, nest, nested JSON loops, um, and we support unnesting, which kind of um, takes one array and produces a semi-small um, table from that array, so that uh, native J SQL fe features work on JSON nested objects. And then there we provide cross joins with the parent table and, and all the other stuff that, that you would need to run SQL on a, on a JSON data set. Does that answer your question? Question here. Uh, to existing documents. Uh, so the current strategy for merging, that's a great question. The current strategy for merging is uh, every document has a primary key. And if you have two documents that come in with the same primary key, uh, the way we merge is we overwrite root fields. Um, but we are working on more advanced JSON patch specification. Uh, which is in a, it's a RFC published some time ago, which tells us, okay, this is how you would structure your update document. So you can also do operations such as append to an array, pop from an array and all other stuff. But for now, it's just, uh, we do duplicate based on primary key and then we overwrite root fields. So was your question more about updating a specific field in a document or was it updating the whole document that you were concerned about? Okay, yeah, so we also take, just to add to his, we also take the unique approach of shredding your entire JSON document into a large set of key value pairs, which is why we can actually update one field in your document without updating the whole document. So unlike other systems that you might be knowing about where if you update one field in a big document, it has to index the whole document. For us, it is a mutable database, so you can update one field without updating the whole document. 
because we shred this document into a individual key values and store key values in our data store. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a great question. I wish we had time for a demo, but we can actually do it. We'll, be, we'll stick around here so we can show you a demo later. What we do is we never actually materialize the schema. Um, so we don't care what the schema is. We have a special kind of query that actually is able to retrieve the schema. But whether we have a field that's a combination of integer and strings, that just works. And if, if in the query, if you want to, uh, let's say, cast that string to an integer, we also support casting operations where you say select uh, cast age as integer, and then all of a sudden now you have a clean schema because online we actually cast, casted your, um, your document. So we call that schema on read uh, approach. Uh, but yeah, so because we never materialize the schema and, and in our code we never have a schema object that we deal with even in, uh, when compiling the query, um, we, can, we can do whatever. Uh, we, we are able to handle whatever schema you have and we even have uh, some customers that have very lots and lots of fields and we just are able to uh, take care of that as well. So I think we're running out of time, so we are going to take questions. Yeah, we'll just stick in front, but yeah, one more question. Okay. Um, so at query time, if you have a normal query, so let's start from uh, search logs, for example. We just go to the data and retrieve data as it is. We don't actually deal with the schema. We have the schema kind uh, query, describe table, where what we do is um, we maintain some statistics and we don't sample. We tell you exactly uh, how many fields are integers and how many fields are strings, because most of the time, if you have a you know dirty data, if you have messy data, um, then let's say one field is a string we want to be able to show that, and we cannot show that if you sample the table. So when we show you the schema, we do not sample. We give you the entire view. So we, uh, we have a couple of in-memory representations. That's a great question. First, in-memory representation is just RocksDB cache, where we store data as pure strings encoded. Then when we load it into our own uh, memory representation, then we have something that we actually want to write blog posts. It's really cool. That is still uh, dispatches per type, so different, different um, encoding in-memory for different types. But then we're also working on the fact if you have an array of integers, so if you only have integers, uh, then we can, we can dispatch to a particular inner loop that only deals with integers and where we use different encoding so that you also get, get this flexibility of int strings uh, so you can work on both integers and strings. But if you only have integers, then we go even faster because now we can, we can uh, you know, uh, optimize much, much tighter loops, uh, assuming this is all, always an integer. Um, so we have many different memory representations and the Specific specificity where array is only of integers, we have not built yet, but we have a design that we, we are planning to. Actually, no, we built it. It was a, yeah. I think we have a prototype that's cool. working. I just remembered. Cool, yeah, we'll Thank stick, uh, uh, we'll just be in front, so if you guys have any more questions or you want to see demo, we're happy sure. to show and share. Thank you very much Thank for coming. Guys.